Such time is 8.30 p.m. Owing all cars, the presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. with any other. The cracking process, my friends, has revolutionized the manufacture of gasoline. It gives you the extra power which is lost by old-time refining methods. You get a gasoline which actually responds instantly to your throttle, which actually gives more power per drop, more miles per gallon. The spectacular rise in Rio Grande sales proves the truth of these statements. And thousands of new Rio Grande gasoline users in the Southwest know what police car performance really means. And now, here is good news for the motorists of Northern and Central California. Within a few days, you too can have the same police car performance. Because Rio Grande cracked gasoline will be made available in your community. Try Rio Grande in your car. Give it a fair trial. You will not be satisfied with any other. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are very glad to welcome back to this microphone Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Good evening, friends. There are untold numbers of police fans who wonder how the police discover that a crime has been committed and how they often develop its investigation to a successful conclusion with a seeming psychic power. Many of our startling crimes have been discovered through the alertness and cooperation of citizens. A noteworthy example was the Ruth Judd case of Phoenix, in which had not an employee of the Southern Pacific Station been on the job, it might never have been solved, and mad Ruth Judd would today be a free woman. This story shows a completion of a necessary cooperation between the citizens and the law enforcement agencies and a cooperation between the Sheriff of Phoenix, Arizona, and your police. The crime of Youth Judd was an amazing, almost an unbelievable one. The way it was unraveled was equally as astounding. Frederick Lindsley will begin the story. Thank you, Chief Davis. <laughs> At 7.45 on the morning of October 19, 1931, train number three rose into the Southern Pacific Station from Phoenix, Arizona. Hello there, Andy. Well, hello, Bill. What do you got? Oh, not much. Four or five trunks, and a couple of them stink like the typhoon. Oh, deer hunters trying to sit some contraband over on us, huh? Oh, I guess so. I'd be mighty glad to get them off the car, I can tell you that. Oh, hey, I don't wonder. Gee, they're pretty bad, all right. Can I help you, ma'am? Yes, please. I'd like my trunk. Here's a check. Oh, yeah. Say, just a moment, please, will you, sir? Mr. Anderson! 
Yeah, what is it, George? But this lady's calling for those trunks. You know the two. Oh, yeah. Say, there's something wrong with those trunks, ma'am. Something wrong? Yeah. Did you notice anything? Why, no. What do you mean? Well, don't you notice a strange odor? Why, yes. Now that you mention it, I think I do. What's in those trunks, Ruth? Well, I have no idea what could smell like that, Burton. Well, I'm sorry, ma'am, but you'll have to unlock the big trunk before I can let you have either of them. Well, that's a little silly. I can't help it, ma'am. This is mighty suspicious. You ain't been hunting deer, have you? No, I haven't been hunting deer. Well, you'll have to open them up. But I haven't any keys with me. Well, perhaps I can find a key to fit the trunk. Oh, I, I wouldn't do that. It might embarrass my sister. Well, I'll have to get the keys for my husband. I'll be back later in the day. When four o'clock arrives and the claimant does not reappear for the trunk, Van de Mark, special investigator for the Southern Pacific, telephones the detective bureau. And Detective Ryan is dispatched to the station where he hears the story from Anderson and Van de Mark. Well, that's about all there is to it. I never showed up again. Well, where, where are the trunks? I had to move them out on the platform. Let's look at them. Sure, this way. Well, there they are. No deer meat ever smells like that. Detective Ryan searches through hundreds of keys at the baggage office until he finds one that will open the locks of the two trunks. When the lids are raised, a horrible sight is revealed to the thickened gaze of the officer. The large trunk contains the body of a woman shot through the head. In the smaller trunk is the inexpertly butchered body of a second woman, minus a section of the torso. Also found in the trunks are letters, postcards, and snapshots from which officers are able to identify the victims as Agnes Anne Leroy and Hedwig Sanderson of 152 North 2nd Street, Phoenix. Ryan immediately phones Phoenix police, giving them a description of the man and woman who called to the trunk, and the name and addresses found with the body. An hour later, Ryan receives a call. Homicide detail. Ryan speaking. Just a moment, Lieutenant. Phoenix is on the wire. Go ahead, Phoenix. Hello, Ryan? Yes? This is Captain Bauer in Phoenix. Oh, yes, Captain. What'd you find out? Well, that house at 152 North 2nd Street has been vacant for several days. Neither Mrs. Leroy nor Miss Samuelson has been seen by the neighbors since last Friday night. Mm, I guess they're the victims, all right. Seems to click. Yeah. Well, we've got an almost positive identification of the Samuelson woman from the snapshot. But we can't be so sure about Leroy. She's pretty badly messed up. Find out anything else? Yeah. From the description you gave me of the woman who called for the trunk, I think she's Mrs. Ruth Judd. J-U-D-D. She's about 25 or 27, blonde and pretty. Hmm, that checks. Her husband is Dr. William C. Judd, and he's in Los Angeles or Santa Monica. Oh, he is? Yes. She communicates with him at 654 13th Street, Santa Monica. Oh, wait till I get that. 654 13th Street, Santa Monica. Right. I don't think there's any doubt that she's the woman we want because she left here Sunday evening on train number three and her landlord tells me he hauled two trunks, a large one and a small one for the depot for her. Say, that's great, Captain. I think we're getting somewhere now. Well, you can count on me for any assistance I can give you. Okay, and thank you very much. What's the door, Brian? Plenty, Inspector. They tell me that our description matches that of Mrs. Ruth Judd, who left Phoenix by number three Sunday night. Well, that's verified by this wire I got from the F.C. while you were talking. They say that those trunks were checked by a woman who gave her name as Mrs. McKennell. But the same woman bought her ticket under the name of Mrs. Judd. I'll get it. Homicide is jail. Inspector Davidson speaking. Tory speaking, Inspector. I've been tracing down the license number of the fourth that woman came for those trunks in. Yeah? What'd you find out? Well, the woman is registered to is that she sold it for a junk to a young fellow on New Hampshire Street. We talked to him, and he said he sold it to Burton McKinnell. McKinnell? Why, that's the name those trunks were checked in. Ah, uh, well, this McKinnell lives in Beverly Glen. We're out of his house now. Anyone home? No, uh -huh, but there's some sandwiches in a sack on the table and half a lemon pie. Might have been bought for, for this Judd woman. 
Stay out there and pick up anyone who returns to the place. Yes, sir. Well, this McKennell, whoever he is, ties into the case, Ryan. Oh. That car this woman used when she gave her the trunk belonged to him. Yeah? Yeah. And probably the young man with her was McKennell. I've got Tories taking the joint. I hope somebody goes back there. It's our only clue. Oh, no, it isn't, Inspector. What do you mean? I didn't get a chance to tell you before. But this Judd woman has been communicating with her husband. Uh, Dr. Judd at 654 13th Street in Santa Monica. Here, there's the dope. Say, that's well. Clark, Bergeron. Yes, sir. Go down to this address in Santa Monica and talk to this Dr. Judd and find out what he knows about this murder. <laughs> Is, it? is this where Dr. Judd lives? Yes. Who are you? I'm his sister. Is he home? Yes. Well, we want to talk to him. Well, come in, please. Thank you. William, here's a couple of gentlemen to see you. Oh, yes? We're from police headquarters, Dr. Judd. Well, I, I thought you'd be here. I've been expecting you. Who's this young man with you? Uh, that's my brother-in-law. What's your name? Uh, Burton McKinnell. Burton McKinnell, huh? You're Ruth Judd's brother? Yes. Were you with her when she went to the Southern Pacific Station to claim some trunks this morning? Yes. You know what has happened, Dr. Judd? Only what Burton has told me. Has your wife been in touch with you? No, I haven't heard from her. What do you know about this thing, young man? Very little. Where's your sister now? I don't know. Frankly, if I did, I wouldn't tell you. You can't blame me for that, can you? We want to know everything you know about this. Well, I don't know where Ruth is. Well, exactly what happened this morning? Well... When I came out of my 11 o'clock class at the university, Ruth was waiting there for me. Yes? She said she wanted me to drive her down to the station and get some trunks and to hurry. And when we got there, we couldn't get them. The baggage man said there was something wrong with them. Ruth seemed to be awfully nervous, but when I asked her what was wrong, she wouldn't tell me. Just said something about being able to justify herself later. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, she wanted to go to 7th and Broadway, so I drove her there and gave her $5, all the money I had with me, and she left me. And that's the last I saw of her. When did you come out here to see Dr. Judd? I came out about a half hour ago, fully expecting to see officers waiting for me, but there was no one here. I asked the doctor if he'd heard from Ruth recently, and he said he'd had a letter this morning, but he hadn't received any phone calls or anything. And I showed him the newspaper. It was a terrible shock to him. Uh, yes, it was, Lieutenant. I, I can't believe that Ruth is guilty. She's not a criminal type. She was never even flighty or a, a, a flapper. She was a sweet, steady girl and a beautiful wife. Well, do you know of any trouble that your wife had with Mrs. Leroy or Miss Samuelson? Well, she's written to me of them frequently, but I, I don't know of any disagreements they had. Did your wife own a gun? Uh, yes, she had a Colt's automatic. I gave it to her several years ago when we were in Mexico, but, but she was always afraid of it. Do you know of any friends that she has in Los Angeles that she might communicate with? No, but if she did have any, I, I feel sure that I'd know about them. Dr. Judd... Will you help us locate your wife? Yes. I do everything I can to persuade her to give herself up. I say this because I'm convinced that if Ruth did this thing, she had she had good reasons for it. Of course, I can't do anything unless she gets in touch with me, and when she does, I'll ask her to give herself up. I know she's innocent. She couldn't have done this horrible thing. She was always so sweet and so kind. She couldn't have done it. Later that night, the missing section of Hedvig Samuelson's body is found, jammed into a suitcase, which had been left in charge of the matron in the ladies' restroom at the Southern Pacific Station. The matron's description tallies with the other descriptions of Ruth Judd. following morning, Chief of Detectives Joseph F. Taylor takes personal charge of the search for the accused murderess. He holds counsel of war in his office. Looks to me as though she couldn't get far if she's only got the five dollars her brother gave her. My hunch is she's somewhere in this town right now. Nevertheless, I want men to watch every railroad station, steamship dock, airport, and bus line in case she tries to duck out. Take care of that, Inspector. Yes, sir. And Inspector. Yes, sir. Ask the immigration officials to watch for her at the border. She speaks Spanish fluently, and she might try to get over the land to Mexico. Yes, sir. Hawtrey. Yes, Chief. 
put our description on the state teletype to all points and broadcast it to all radio cars. Yes, sir. Also broadcast direct to citizens, asking them to report all women hitchhikers. I'll do that, sir, and I'll get the local radio stations to cooperate. That's fine. Now, boys, you realize we're going to get a lot of crank tips on this case. We always do. But I want you to run down every one of them, no matter how vague it is. I'm not going to give any of you any rest until Ruth's judge sits across this desk for me. While scores of police search for Mrs. Judd, while Dr. Judd and Burton McKinnell are kept under constant surveillance, while an officer is stationed in the house of Dr. Judd's sister in Santa Monica to investigate every telephone call, while newspapers scream headlines characterizing Winnie Ruth Judd as a velvet tigress, three long, fruitless days go by, during which nothing develops but a tangled welter of statements from Phoenix acquaintances of the principles of the crime that makes the motive for the crime more and more obscure. While the woman hunt continues, public interest rises to a fever heat. The man in the street discusses nothing else and eagerly buys each edition of the newspaper in hopes of further news of the engrossing mystery. On Tuesday morning, the Los Angeles Examiner offers a $1,000 reward for information leading to the apprehension of Ruth Judd. On Wednesday morning, the Times offers $1,500. The afternoon papers carry a public message from Dr. Judd. It reads, Ruth, come back. Please surrender. Come back and tell your story. You couldn't have done these things alone. Don't try to protect anyone. On Thursday, Dr. Judd states that if he could have but five minutes alone with his wife, he could persuade her to give herself up, whether she is right or wrong. Friday, the tension grows. As men stop to discuss the case on the streets, as housewives chat with neighbors about this amazing member of their sex, across the entire city sweeps the feeling that something has to happen. Then, shortly after noon, in the office of the attorney retained by Dr. Judd, the phone rings. Hello? Mm. Dr. Judd, Why, no, not right now. Who is it? Uh, yes. I must speak to the doctor. Well, I can't talk right now. There are too many people around. You call Mutual 8331 in an hour, and I'll have him there. The attorney rushes to the Hall of Justice, where Dr. Judd is attending an inquest on the bodies of the two victims. Together, they return to the office to wait for the call. One o'clock. One thirty comes and goes. The hands of the clock slowly approach two. Dr. Judd feverishly faces the silent telephone. And then... Uh, hello? Hello? Oh, doctor, darling. Oh, Ruth. Where are you? I, I'm... I'm afraid to tell you, doctor. Please forget me. I'm afraid. But, Ruth, honey, if you tell me, Mr. Russell and I will come and get you, and we won't bring the police... Thomas, Doctor. Of course. Uh, look, Ruth, are you downtown? Yes. All right. You know where the Biltmore Garage is? Yes. Well, you go there, and we'll meet you there in just a few minutes, dear. <laughs> Judge Russell arranges with a friend of his who owns an undertaking parlor on Bunker Hill to meet them with a car at the Biltmore Garage and take them to his establishment until he can question his clients. Then the doctor and the attorney hurry down Olive Street to Fifth and up Fifth to the Biltmore Garage. Dr. Judd recognizes his frightened wife and gestures to her to enter the garage. Then he goes in by another entrance and motions her to get into the funeral director's car. He follows her a moment later. Oh, Dr. Darling, don't let the police get me. Don't let them oh, get now, me. Now, don't you worry, darling. You'd better crouch down on the floor, Mrs. Judd. All right. Okay, Dave, let's go. You won't let the police get me, will you, Doctor? You won't let them, Mr. Russell. 
will you? We have to talk that over, Mr. Judd. But first, let's get you out of sight. And at about the same time in Chief Taylor's office in the city hall, a tense group of cigarette-smoking reporters wait. Their eyes hollow from three sleepless nights on the job. Well, if you ask me, she'll come drifting in on the beach one of these days. She was going to throw those trunks in the ocean. She's probably done the same thing with herself by this time. No, I think you're all wrong there. Now, my theory is that she... Hey, hey, pipe down. Madeline's got a call. Chief Taylor's office. Yes, he's in his office. Just a minute, please. Sounds hot. Who was that, Madeline? Just a personal call. Oh, come on, Madeline. Don't hold down. Yeah, with your breakdown. Well, if you must know, that was the chief's wife wanting to know if he'd be home to dinner. Well, whose call is he waiting for, Madeline? I told you, boys, I don't know. And we thought you were our pal. Sure I am, but I don't know any more about this than you do. Wait, wait a minute. Maybe this is it. Chief Taylor's office. Just a moment. For you, Al. Oh, thanks. Hello? Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what was it? Oh, nothing. The desk just phoned to be sure that I was here. That's all. <laughs> they got your number, all right. Checking up on you, huh? Yeah. Well, I guess I'll be running along. Oh, running along? Where? Oh, where do you suppose? Do I have to raise my hand? Uh, that doesn't sound right to me. I'll bet he's got a tip. Chief Taylor's office. Yes, just a minute, please. For the chief? Yes. Well, who was it this time? His grandma? Miss Hannah. Yes, Chief. Come in, please. Yes, sir. Close the door. I want you to phone the Alexandria Hotel and tell District Attorney Andrews to come down here and wait for me. He was returning to Phoenix tonight. Tell him to cancel his reservation. That he use his phone in here. Have they found it? Yes. And I'm going over to get her right now. Now, what's the word, Chief? How about a statement, Chief? Nothing new yet, boys. Well, where are you going? Me? Oh, I'm just going out to get some cigarettes. Oh, well, boys, maybe we all better go out and get some cigarettes. While Chief Taylor rushes to the undertaking establishment where Ruth Judd has been taken by her husband and his attorney, the hunted woman is being treated for a wound in her hand by Dr. Judd. Oh, Dr. Darling... That hurt. Now, please be patient, Ruth. I've got to get the bandage off. It, it's all stuck. Oh. That's the only reason I gave myself up. I was afraid of luck, Joe. Now, dear, this is going to hurt. Now, there. Oh. There, now, there, now, now. Well, that is a very nasty wound. Uh-huh. Uh, Hedwig did it. Hedwig shot me in the hand. I shot in self-defense, Doctor, dear. Mr. Russell, I shot in self-defense. Yes, Mrs. Judge. But now you must be quiet. You didn't have to call the police, Mr. Russell. I don't see why you did that. I'm innocent. There's nothing else I could do, Mrs. Judd. If I hadn't informed the police, we'd all be open to prosecution for harboring a criminal. Harboring a criminal, huh? So I'm a criminal. You're afraid for yourselves, is that it? Now, please, Ruth, please, you must be quiet. Nobody has called you a criminal. We all believe that if you... If you did this thing, you were justified. Of course I'd be justified. I shot in self-defense. Oh... Oh, doctor, darling. That hurts. Oh, there, now. I won't hurt you anymore. Now, this bandage will do until we get you to the hospital. Uh, Come in. This is Mrs. Judd? Yes. I'm a police officer, Mrs. Judd. I have here a warrant for your arrest on a charge of murder. Yes. Will you come with me, please? Yes. Oh, you've been injured. I've been shot through the hand. Well, then I'll send for an ambulance. Oh, no. Please. I can go to the hospital in a car. Oh, very well. You'll come with me, please. The car is waiting downstairs. her hand is dressed, Ruth Judd is escorted to police headquarters, but on advice of counsel refuses to answer any of the police officer's questions. However, the next day, the detectives find the torn bits of a 16-page confession she had written to Dr. Judd, and then attempted to destroy in a drain of a lady's restroom. The torn bits are fitted together. 
Then Ruth Judd talks freely, although all her statements, as well as the content of the letter, are apparently designed to develop a plea of self-defense. On October 29th, Ruth Judd is removed to Phoenix. And on January 19th, 1932, she goes on trial for her life. A trial which is highlighted by the alternate moodiness and hysteria of the accused and by the battles of alienists on both sides in an attempt to build up and tear down an insanity plea. On February 8th, the prosecuting attorney opens the argument for the state. Gentlemen of the jury, you have heard the arguments of a distinguished alienist for the defense. You have heard them testify to the alleged glandular disorders of the defendant. This is absolutely ridiculous and absurd, and it's the rankest nonsense. Ruth Judd knew what she was doing. Early in the game, her plans went wrong when she was faced with the necessity of changing the bodies from one trunk to two in order to get away with the shipment. And she did this, although she insists that she'd been shot during the argument and at the time had a bullet lodged in her hand. I ask you, gentlemen, if this is possible. No, gentlemen, it is not. Ruth Judd did not have a bullet lodged in her hand on Friday night, the year on Saturday morning. You've heard the testimony of witnesses who saw that hand unbandaged on Saturday morning. Ruth Judd, gentlemen, shot herself in the hand sometime after Sunday morning, a Saturday morning, in an attempt to prove a defense plea. In doing this, she showed more sense than you or I would under similar circumstances. <laughs> Gentlemen, if this is insanity, then we had best build a fence around the whole of Maricopa County and make an insane asylum out of it. <laughs> This trial has been a ridiculous part, a weak attempt on the part of my honored colleagues, the prosecution. For, gentlemen of the jury, the state has not even proved that Mrs. Judd has committed this crime. The state has failed to show that Mrs. Judd was even at the murder of Hartman. You have heard the testimony regarding the pitiful delusions of motherhood suffered by the accused. You've heard of her unbalanced nature. Poor creature, a victim of a hereditary strain of insanity, she is not at all times responsible for her acts. I ask you, gentlemen of the jury, deal with her as you might with an erring sister. Understand her as you might a sick child. I ask you, gentlemen, to bring back a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. And let the state take care of this woman as a sick person and not as a corpse. The state did prove that Ruth Judd was near the murder apartment on October the 16th. You've heard the testimony of B.W. Jeremy, the streetcar conductor, who stated that he had seen Ruth Judd alight from his car near the bungalow where the crime occurred at 10 o'clock on either Friday or Saturday night. Well, gentlemen, it had to be Friday night because we have conclusive proof that at that hour on Saturday night, Mrs. Judd was in the company of Mr. Schwartz, the transfer man who had been called to move the trunk containing the body. This woman, Ruth Judd, is a cold-blooded murderer. <laughs> to attain her end. Now, when we qualified you as jurors in this case, you told us, you believe in the assessment of the death penalty in the proper case? That you thought the death penalty law, as written on the statute books of the state of Arizona, was a good law? If this is not a proper...
criminal case for the assessment of the death penalty, then I know of no such case. In behalf of the citizens of Arizona, your friends and neighbors, I ask that you bring back a verdict of guilty with death as the penalty. <laughs>